Welcome to the final chapter of Homegoing by Jan Jesse. This is Marcus's narrative. He is Sonny's or Carson's son. <clears throat> and this is the very final chapter of our novel. Um, if you're watching this as I'm uploading them, I've done a couple of them out of order just because my schedule has been busy and I've been sick. But I am going to upload Marjorie and Akua um, after I finish this one. So not to worry, those will be present as well. Sorry, not Akua. I think I've already done that one. Yaw is the one that I'm missing. Um, but we're going to do Marcus first because it's very important that we read this last chapter. Okay. We are on page 284. Marcus didn't care for water. He was in college the first time he saw the ocean up close, and it had made his stomach turn. All that space, that endless blue, reaching out farther than an eye could hold. It terrified him. He hadn't told his friends he didn't know how to swim, and his roommate, a redhead from Maine, was already seven feet under the surface of the Atlantic before Marcus even stepped his toes in. There was something about the smell of the ocean that nauseated him. That wet salt stink clung to his nose and made him feel as though he were already drowning. He could feel it thick in his throat, like brine, clinging to that place where his uvula hung so that he couldn't breathe right. When he was young, his father told him that black people didn't like water because they were brought over on slave ships. What did a black man want to swim for? The ocean floor was already littered with black men. Marcus always nodded patiently when his father said things like this. Sonny was forever talking about slavery, the prison labor complex, the system, segregation, the man. His father had a deep-seated hatred of white people, a hatred like a bag filled with stones, one stone for every year racial injustice continued to be the norm in America. He still carried the bag. Marcus would never forget his father's early teachings, the alternative history lessons that Marcus got Marcus interested in studying America more closely in the first place. The two had shared a mattress in Ma Willie's cramped apartment. In the evenings, lying on the mattress with springs like knives, Sonny would tell Marcus about how America used to lock up black men off the sidewalks for labor, or how redlining kept banks from investing in black neighborhoods, preventing mortgages or business loans. So was it a wonder that prisons were still full of them? Was it a wonder that the ghetto was the ghetto? There were things Sonny used to talk about that Marcus never saw in his history books, but that later, when he got to college, he learned to be true. He learned that his father's mind was a brilliant mind, but it was trapped underneath something. In the mornings, Marcus used to watch Sonny get up, shave, and leave for the methadone clinic in East Harlem. It was easier to follow the movements of his father than it was to watch a clock. At 6.30, he got up and had a glass of orange juice. By 6.45, he was shaving, and by 7, he was out the door. He would get his methadone, and then he would head over to work as a custodian at the hospital. He was the smartest man Marcus knew, but he never could get completely out from under the dope he used to use. When he was seven, Marcus once asked Ma Willie what would happen if some part of Sonny's schedule was to change. What would happen if he didn't get the methadone? His grandmother just shrugged. It wasn't until Marcus was much older that he started to understand just how important his father's routine was. His entire life seemed to hang in this balance. Now Marcus was near the water again, a new grad school mate had invited him to a pool party to celebrate the new millennium, and Marcus had, hesitantly, accepted. A pool in California was safer than the Atlantic, sure. He could lounge on the chair and pretend he was just there for the sun. He could make jokes about how he needed to tan. Someone yelled, cannonball, sending a cold, wet splash onto Marcus's legs. He wiped it off, grimacing, after Deontay handed him a towel. Shit, Marcus, how long are we going to stay out here, man? It's hot as hell. This is some Africa heat right here. Deontay was always complaining. He was an artist whom Marcus met at a house party in East Palo Alto. And even though Deontay had grown up in Atlanta, something about him reminded Marcus of home. They'd been like brothers ever since. We ain't been here but 10 minutes, D. Chill, Marcus said. But he was starting to feel restless too. Nah, I ain't about to burn up in this damn heat. Let me catch you later. He got up and shot a small wave to the people in the pool. Deontay was, almost, was always asking to go to school events with Marcus and then leaving almost as soon as they arrived. He was looking for a girl he'd met at an art museum once. He couldn't remember her name, but he told Marcus that he could tell she was a schoolgirl just from the way she talked. 
Marcus didn't feel the need to remind him that there were about a million universities in the area. Who could say the girl would end up at one of his parties? Marcus was getting his PhD in sociology at Stanford. It was something he would never have been able to imagine doing back when he was splitting a mattress with his father. And yet, there he was. Sonny had been so proud when he told him he'd been accepted to Stanford that he cried. It was the only time Marcus had ever seen him do it. Marcus left the party soon after Deontay, making up some excuse about work. He walked the six miles home, and when he got there, he was sweating through his shirt. He got into the blue tiled shower and let the water beat over his head, never lifting his face up toward it, still scared of drowning. Your mama says hi, Sonny said. It was their weekly phone call. Marcus made it every Sunday afternoon when he knew his Aunt Josephine and all the cousins would be in Ma Willie's house cooking and eating after church. He called because he missed Harlem. He missed Sunday dinners. He missed Ma Willie singing gospel at the top of her voice, as if Jesus would be there in 10 minutes if she would only just summon him to come fix a plate. Don't lie, Marcus said. The last time he'd seen Amani was his high school graduation. His mother had dressed up in some outfit Ma Willie had given her, no doubt. It was a long sleeved dress, but when she lifted her arm to wave at him while he crossed the stage to get his diploma, Marcus was almost certain he could see the tracks. Humph, was all Sonny replied. Y'all doing good over there? Marcus asked. The kids and them all okay? Yeah, we good, we good. They breathed into the phone for a bit, neither wanting to speak, but neither wanting to hang up the phone either. You still straight? Marcus asked. He didn't ask often, but he asked. Yeah, I'm good. Don't you worry about me. Keep your head in them books. Don't be thinking about me. Marcus nodded. It took him a while to realize that his father wouldn't be able to hear that. And so he said, okay. And they finally hung up the phone. Afterward, Deontay came by to get him. He was dragging Marcus to a museum in San Francisco, the same one where Deontay had met the girl. I don't know why you're sweating this girl, Dee, Marcus said. He didn't really enjoy art museums. He never knew what to make of the pieces that he saw. He would listen to Deontay talk about lines and color and shading. He would nod, but really, it all meant nothing to him. If you saw her, you'd understand, Deontay said. They were walking around the museum, and neither of them was really taking in the art. I understand she must look good. Yeah, she looked good, but it ain't even about that, man. Marcus had already heard it before. Deontay had met the woman at the Kara Walker exhibit. The two of them had paced the floor-to-ceiling black paper silhouettes four times, before their shoulders brushed on the fifth pass. They'd talked about one piece in particular for nearly an hour, never remembering to get each other's name. I'm telling you, Marcus, you're gonna be at the wedding soon. All I gotta do is find her. Marcus snorted. How many times had Deontay pointed out his wife at a party only to date her for a week? He left Deontay to himself and wandered the museum alone. More than the art, he liked the museum's architecture the intricate stairways and white walls that held works of vibrant colors. He liked the walking and the thinking that the atmosphere allowed him to do. He had been to a museum once on a class field trip back in elementary school. They'd taken the bus, then walked the remaining blocks on the buddy system, each child holding the next child's hand. Marcus could remember feeling awed by the rest of Manhattan, the part that wasn't his, the business suits and feathered hair. In the museum, the ticket taker had smiled at them from way up in the glass booth, Marcus had been craning his neck in order to see her, and she'd rewarded his efforts with a little wave. Once they'd gone inside, their teacher, Mrs. McDonald, had led them through room after room, exhibit after exhibit. Marcus was at the end of the line, and Latavia, the girl whose hand he held, had dropped his in order to sneeze, and so Marcus had taken the opportunity to tie his shoe. When he lifted his head again, his class had moved on. Thinking back, he should have been able to find them quickly, a line of little black ducklings in the big white museum, but... There were so many people and all so tall and he couldn't see his way around them. And he quickly grew too frightened to move. He was standing there paralyzed and quietly crying when an elderly white couple found him. Look, Howard, the woman said. Marcus could still remember the color of the woman's dress, a deep bleeding red that only served to scare him even more. Poor thing's probably lost or something. She studied him carefully, said, he's a cute one, isn't he? The man, Howard, was carrying a slender cane and he tapped at Marcus's foot with it. You lost, boy? Marcus didn't speak. I said you lost? The cane kept hitting at his foot and for a second Marcus had felt as though at any moment the man would lift the cane all the way up toward the ceiling and send it crashing over his head. He couldn't guess why he felt that way. 
but it had scared him so badly he could start to feel a wet stream traveling down his pant legs. He'd screamed and ran from one white-walled room to another to another until a security guard had chased him down, called the teacher over the intercom, and sent the whole class back out into the street, back onto the bus, back home to Harlem. Deontay found him after a while. She ain't here, he said. Marcus rolled his eyes. What did he expect? The two of them left the museum. A month passed, and it was time again for Marcus to return to his research. He had been avoiding it because it wasn't going well. Originally, he'd wanted to focus his work on the convict leasing system that had stolen years off of his great-grandpa H's life. But the deeper into the research he got, the bigger the project got. How could he talk about great-grandpa H's story without also talking about his grandma Willie and the millions of other Black people who had migrated north, fleeing Jim Crow? And if he mentioned the Great Migration, he'd have to talk about the cities that they took flock in, that took that flock in. He'd have to talk about Harlem. And how could he talk about Harlem without mentioning his father's heroin addiction, the stints in prison, the criminal record? And if he was going to talk about heroin in Harlem in the 60s, wouldn't he also have to talk about crack everywhere in the 80s? And if he wrote about crack, he'd inevitably re be writing, too, about the war on drugs. And if he started talking about the war on drugs, he'd be talking about how nearly half of the Black men he grew up with were on their way either into or out of what had become the harshest prison system in the world. And if he talked about why friends from his hood were doing five-year bids for possession of marijuana when nearly all the white people he'd gone to college with smoked it openly every day, he'd get so angry that he'd slam the research book on the table of the beautiful but deadly silent Lane Reading Room of Green Library of Stanford University. And if he slammed the book down, then everyone in the room would stare, and all they would see would be his skin and his anger, and they'd think they knew something about him. And it would be the same something that had justified putting his great-grandpa H in prison. Only it would be different, too. Less obvious than it once was. When Marcus started to think this way, he couldn't get himself to open even one book. He couldn't remember exactly when the need for studying and knowing his family more intimately had struck him. Maybe it was during one of those Sunday dinners at Ma Willie's house, when his grandmother had asked that they all hold hands and pray. He would be shoved between two of his cousins or his father and Aunt Josephine, and Ma Willie would begin one of her prayers with a song. His grandmother's voice was one of the wonders of the world. It was enough to stir in him all of the hope and love and faith that he would ever possess, all coming together to make his heart pulse and his palms sweat. He'd have to let go of someone's hand in order to wipe his own hands, his tears. In that room with his family, he would sometimes imagine a different room, a fuller family. He would imagine so hard that at times he thought he could see them. Sometimes in a hut in Africa, a patriarch holding a machete. Sometimes outside in a forest of palm trees, a crowd watching a young woman carrying a bucket on her head. Sometimes in a cramped apartment with too many kids or a small failing farm around a burning tree or in a classroom. He would see these things while his grandmother prayed and sang prayed and sang, and he would want so badly for all the people he made up in his head to be there in that room with him. He told his grandmother this after one of the Sunday dinners, and she told him that maybe he had the gift of visions. But Marcus never could make himself believe in the God of Ma Willie. And so he'd gone about looking for family and searching for answers in a more tangible way through his research and his writing. Now Marcus jotted down a few notes and headed out to meet Deontay. His friend's mission to find the mysterious woman from the museum had ended, but his taste for parties and outings had not. They ended up in San Francisco that night. A lesbian couple Deontay knew had opened up their house into a gallery night slash Afro-Caribbean dance party. When they walked in, they were greeted by the tinny sound of large steel drums. Men with brightly colored kente cloths wrapped around their waists held drum mallets with round pink tips. A woman stood at the end of this row of men, wailing out a song. Marcus pushed farther in. The art on the walls frightened him a little, though he would never admit it to Deontay if, or more likely when, his friend asked his opinion. The piece Deontay had contributed was of a woman with horns strung around a baobab tree. Marcus didn't understand it at all, but he stood under it for a short while, his head tilted to the left, nodding slightly whenever someone appeared next to him. Soon the person next to him was Deontay. His friend poked him in the shoulder repeatedly, all the jabs in quick succession, so that he had finished before Marcus would tell him to stop. What? Marcus said, turning to look at him. 
It was like Deontay didn't even realize someone else was there. His body was angled away and he suddenly turned it back toward Marcus. She's here. Who? The fuck you mean who? The girl, man, she's here. Marcus turned his gaze toward where Deontay was pointing. There were two women standing side by side. The first was tall and skinny, light skinned like Marcus himself was, but with dreadlocks that drifted down past her ass. She was playing with her locks, twirling them around her finger or taking the whole lot of them and piling them onto the very top of her head. The woman next to her was the one who caught Marcus's eye. She was dark, blue-black, they would have called her on playgrounds in Harlem. And she was thick with sturdy, large breasts and a wild afro that made her look as though at some point very recently she had been kissed by lightning. Come on, man, Deontay said, already walking toward the women. women. Marcus walked a little bit behind him. He could see Deontay trying to play it cool, the calculated slouch, the careful lean. When they got to the women, Marcus waited to see which one was the one. You, the woman with the dreadlocks said, slapping Deontay's shoulder. I thought I recognized you, but I couldn't remember where I would have known you from, Deontay said. Marcus rolled his eyes. We met at the museum a couple of months ago, the woman said, smiling. Right, right, of course, Deontay said. He was on his best behavior now, standing straight and smiling. I'm Deontay, and this is my friend Marcus. The woman flattened her skirt and picked up another lock, started to twirl it around her finger. Preening, it seemed. The woman next to her hadn't said a word yet, and her eyes were mostly trained on the ground, as though if she didn't look at them, she could pretend they weren't there. I'm Kai, the dreadlocked woman said, and this is my friend, Marjorie. At the mention of her name, Marjorie lifted her head, the curtain of wild hair parting to reveal a lovely face and a beautiful necklace. Nice to meet you, Marjorie, Marcus said, extending his hand. When Marcus was just a little boy, his mother, Amani, had taken him for the day. Stolen him, really, for Ma, Willie, and Sonny and the rest of the family had no idea that Amani, who had asked just to say hi, would lure him away from the apartment with the promise of an ice cream cone. His mother couldn't afford the cone. Marcus could remember her walking with him from one parlor to another shop to another and another in the hope that the prices would be better at a place just a little bit farther down. Once they reached Sonny's old neighborhood, Marcus knew two things with certainty. First, that he was somewhere he was not supposed to be. And second, that there would be no ice cream. His mother had dragged him up and down 116th Street, showing him off to her dope fiend friends, the broke jazz crew. This your baby, one fat, toothless woman said, squatting so that Marcus was looking straight down the barrel of her empty mouth. Yep, this Marcus. The woman touched him and then waddled on. Amani kept navigating him through a part of Harlem that he knew only through stories, through the salvation prayers the church congregants put up each Sunday. The sun got lower and lower in the sky. Amani started crying and yelling at him to walk faster, though he was going as fast as his little legs could carry him. It was nearly dusk before Ma, Willie, and Sonny found him. His father had snatched his hand and tugged him away so fast he thought his arm would escape its socket. And he'd watched as his grandmother struck Amani hard across the face, saying loud enough for anyone to hear, touch this child again and see what happens. Marcus thought about that day often. He was still amazed by it. Not by the fear he'd felt throughout the day, when the woman who was no more than a stranger to him had dragged him farther and farther from home, but by the fullness of love and protection he'd felt later, when his family had finally found him. Not the being lost, but the being found. It was the same feeling he got whenever he saw Marjorie, like she had somehow found him. Months had passed, and Deontay and Kai's relationship fizzled, leaving only Marcus and Marjorie's friendship as evidence of its ever having been. Deontay teased Marcus about Marjorie's constant, Marjorie constantly, saying, when are you going to tell that girl you went to her? But Marcus couldn't explain to Deontay that it wasn't about that, because he didn't really understand himself what it was about. So this is the Asante region, Marjorie said, pointing to a map of Ghana on her wall. This is technically where my family's from, but my grandmother moved down to the central region right here to be closer to the beach. I hate the beach, Marcus said. At first, Marjorie smiled at him, like she was going to start laughing. But then she stopped, and her eyes turned serious. Are you scared of it? She asked. She let her finger drift slowly from the edge of the map down to the wall. She rested her hand against the black stone necklace she wore every day. Yeah, I 
guess I am, Marcus said. He had never told anyone before. My grandmother said she could hear the people who were stuck on the ocean floor talking to her, our ancestors. She was kind of crazy. That don't sound crazy to me. Shit, everybody in my grandma's church caught a spirit at one point or another. Just because somebody sees or hears or feels something other folks can't doesn't mean they're crazy. My grandma used to say, a blind man don't call us crazy for seeing. Now Marjorie gave him a real smile. You want to know what I'm scared of? She asked, and he nodded. He had learned not to be surprised by how forthcoming she was, how she never gave in to small talk, just dove right into deep waters. Fire, she said. He had heard the story of her father's scar in the, in the week, first week of meeting Marjorie. Her answer didn't surprise him. My grandmother used to say we were born of a great fire. I wish I knew what she meant by that. You ever get back to Ghana? Oh, I have been busy with grad school and teaching and all that. She paused and looked into the air, counting. I haven't been back since my grandmother died, actually, she said softly. She gave me this. A family heirloom, I guess. Marjorie pointed to the necklace. Marcus nodded. So that was why Marjorie never took it off. It was getting late and Marcus had work to do, but he couldn't move from this particular spot in Marjorie's living room. There was a large bay window that let in so much light that his shoulder felt brushed with warmth. He wanted to stay for as long as he could. She would have hated to know that it's been so long, almost 14 years. When my parents were alive, they used to try to make me go, but it was too painful, losing her. And then I lost my parents and I guess I just didn't see the point anymore. My twee's so rusty, I don't know if I could even get around anyway. She forced a laugh, but looked away as soon as it escaped her lips. She hid her face from him for what seemed like a long stretch of time. The sun finally reached a place where the window couldn't catch its light. Marcus could feel the heat lifting off his shoulder, and he wanted it back. Marcus spent the rest of the school year avoiding his research. He couldn't see the point anymore. He had gotten a grant that would take him to Birmingham so that he could see what was left of Pratt City. He went with Marjorie, and they'd, all they'd been able to find was a blind and probably crazy old man who claimed he knew Marcus's great-grandpa H when he was just a boy. You could do your research on Pratt City, Marjorie had suggested when they left the man's house. Seems like an interesting town. When the old man had heard Marjorie's voice, he said he wanted to feel her, that this was how he got to know a person. Marcus had watched amazed and somewhat embarrassed as she let the man run his hands along her arms and finally her face, like he was reading her. It was her patience that had amazed him. In the short time that he'd known her, he could already tell that she had enough patience to take her through almost any storm. Marcus sometimes studied, her, studied with her in the library, and he would watch out of the corners of his eyes as she devoured book after book after book. Her work was in African and African-American literature. And when Marcus asked her why she chose those subjects, she said that those were the books that she could feel inside of her. When the old man touched her, she had looked at him so patiently, as though while he read her skin, she was also reading him. That's not the point, he said. What is the point, Marcus? She stopped walking. For all they knew, they were standing on top of what used to be a coal mine, a grave for all the black convicts who had been conscripted to work there. It was one thing to research something, Another thing entirely to have lived it, to have felt it. How could he explain to Marjorie that what he wanted to capture with his project was the feeling of time, of having been a part of something that stretched so far back, was so impossibly large that it was easy to forget that she and he and everyone else existed in it, not apart from it, but inside it. How could he explain to Marjorie that he wasn't supposed to be here, alive, free, that the fact that he had been born, that he wasn't in a jail cell somewhere, was not by dint of his pulling of himself up by the bootstraps, not by hard work or belief in the American dream, but by mere chance. He had only heard tell of his great-grandpa H from Ma Willie, but those stories were enough to make him weep and to fill him with pride. Two Shovel H, they had called him. But what had they called his father or his father before him? What of the mothers? They had been products of their time. And walking in Birmingham now, Marcus was an accumulation of these times. That was the point. Instead of saying any of this, he said, you know why I'm scared of the ocean? She shook her head. 
it's not just because I'm scared of drowning, though I, I guess I am. It, it's because of all that space. It's because everywhere I look, I see blue and I have no idea where it begins. When I'm out there, I stay as close as I can to the sand because at least then I know where it ends. She didn't speak for a while, just continued walking a little bit ahead of him. Maybe she was thinking about fire, the thing she had told him she most feared. Marcus had never seen so much as a picture of her father, but he imagined that he had been a fearsome man with a scar covering one whole side of his face. He imagined that Marjorie feared fire for the same reasons he feared water. She stopped beneath the broken lamppost that flickered an eerie light on and off and on and off. I bet you would like the beach in Cape Coast, she said. It's beautiful there. Not like anything you would see in America. Marcus laughed. I don't think anyone in my family's ever left the country. I wouldn't know what to do on a plane ride that long. You mostly just sleep, she said. He couldn't wait to get out of Birmingham. Pratt City was long gone and he wasn't going to find what he was looking for in the ruins of that place. He didn't know if he would ever find it. All right, he said, let's go. Excuse me, sir, you wanna go see Slave Castle? I take you see Slave, see Cape Coast Castle. Ten setties, sir, just ten setties. I take you to see nice castle. Marjorie was rushing him through the Trotro stop, hurrying them toward a cab that would take them to their beach resort. Days before, they had been in Edueso, paying respects to her father's birthplace. Only hours before, they'd been in Takurati, doing the same for her mother's. Everything was brilliant here, even the ground. Everywhere they went, Marcus would notice sparkling red dust. It coated his body by the end of every night. Now there would be sand to join it. Don't mind them, Marjorie said, moving Marcus past the group of young boys and girls who were trying to draw him toward them to buy this or that, take him here or there. He stopped Marjorie. You ever seen it? The castle? They were in the middle of a busy street and cars were blaring their horns, though it could have been at anyone. The many thin girls with buckets on their heads, the boys selling newspapers, the whole entire country with skin like his, hustling about, making driving near impossible. Still, they found a way to pass. Marjorie clutched at her backpack straps, pulled them away from her body. No, actually, I've never been. That's what the black tourists do when they come here. He lifted an eyebrow at her. You know what I mean, she said. Well, I'm black and I'm a tourist. Marjorie sighed and checked her watch though they had nowhere they needed to go. They had come for the beach, and they had all week to see it. Okay, fine, I'll take you. They took a cab to their resort to set down their things. From the balcony, Marcus caught his first real glimpse of the beach. It seemed to stretch for miles and miles. Sunlight bounced off of the sand, making it shimmer. Sand like diamonds in the once gold coast. There was almost no one milling around the castle that day, save for a few women who were gathered around a very old tree, eating nuts and plating each other's hair. They looked at Marcus and Marjorie as the two of them walked up, but they didn't move. Marcus started to wonder if he was really seeing them in the flesh. If ever there was a place to believe was haunted, this was it. From the outside, the castle was a glowing white, powder white, like the entire thing had been scrubbed down to gleaming, cleansed of any stains. Marcus wondered who made it shine like that and why. When they entered, things started to look dingier. The dirty skeleton of a long past shame that held the place together began to show itself in blackening concrete, rusty hinged doors. Soon a man so skinny and tall he looked like he was made from stretched rubber bands greeted them and the four others who had signed up for the tour. He said something to Marjorie Infante and she spoke back in the halting, apologetic twee she had been speaking all week. As they walked toward the wrong, long row of cannons that looked out at the sea, Marcus stopped her. What did he say? He whispered. He knew my grandmother. He wished me aquapa. It was one of the few words Marcus had learned in his time here. Welcome. Marjorie's family, strangers on the street, even the man who had checked them in at the airport, had been saying it to her their entire stay. They had been saying it to him, too. This is where the church was, the rubber band man said, pointing. It stands directly above the dungeons. You could walk around this upper level, go into that church, and never know what was going on underneath. In fact, many of the British soldiers married local women, and their children, along with other local children, would go to school right here in this upper level. Other children would be sent to England for school, and they would come back to form an elite class. Next to him, Marjorie shifted her weight, and Marcus tried not to look at her. It was the way most people lived their lives, on upper levels, 
not stopping to peer underneath. And soon they were headed down, down into the belly of this large beached beast. Here there was grime that could not be washed away, green and gray and black and brown and dark, so dark. There were no windows, there was no air. This is one of the female dungeons, the guide said finally, leading them into a room that still smelled faintly. They kept as many as 250 women here for about three months at a time. From here, they would lead them out this door. He walked further. The group left the dungeon and moved together toward the door. It was a wooden door painted black. Above it, there was a sign that read, Door of No Return. This door leads out to the beach, where ships waited to take them away. Them. Them. Always them. No one called them by name. No one in the group spoke. They all stood still, waiting. For what? Marcus didn't know. Suddenly, he felt sick to his stomach. He wanted to be somewhere else, anywhere else. He didn't think. He just started to push at the door. He could hear the guide asking him to stop, yelling at Marjorie and Fonte. He could hear Marjorie, too. He could feel her arm on his hand. Then he could feel his hand push through. Then finally, there was light. Marcus started running onto the beach. Outside, there were hundreds of fishermen tending their bright turquoise nets. There were long, handcrafted rowboats as far as the eye could see. Each boat had a flag of no nationality, of every nationality. There was a purple polka-dotted one beside a British one, a blood-orange one beside a French one, a Ghanaian one next to an American one. Marcus ran until he found two men with dark, gleaming, shoe-polished skin who were building a dazzling fire with flames that licked out and up, crawling toward the water. They were cooking fish on the fire, and when they saw him, they stopped, stared. He could hear her feet behind him before he could see her, the sound of feet hitting sand, a light muffled sound. She stopped many paces away from him, and when she spoke, her voice was a distant thing, carried by sea-salted wind. What's wrong, Marjorie shouted, and he just kept staring out into the water. It went every direction that his eye could see. It splashed up toward his feet threatening to put out the fire. Come here, he said, finally turning to look at her. She glanced at the fire, and it was only then he remembered her fear. Come, he said, again. Come see. She stepped a little bit closer, but stopped again when the fire roared into the sky. It's okay, he said, and he believed it. He held out his hand. It's okay. She walked to where he stood, where the fire met the water. He took her hand and they both looked out into the abyss of it. The fear that Marcus had felt inside the castle was still there, but he knew it was like the fire, a wild thing that could still be controlled, contained. Then Marjorie released his hand. He watched her run headlong into the crashing waves of the water, watched her dip under until he lost her, and all he could do was wait for her to resurface. When she did, she looked at him, her arms moving circles around her, and though she didn't speak, he knew what she was saying. It was his turn to come to her. He closed his eyes and walked in until the water met his calves. And then he held his breath, started to run, run underwater. Soon waves crashed over his head and all around him. Water moved into his nose and stung his eyes. When he finally lifted his head up from the sea to cough, then breathe, he looked out at all the water before him, at the vast expanse of time and space. He could hear Marjorie laughing, and soon he laughed too. When he finally reached her, she was moving just enough to keep her head above water. The black stone necklace rested just below her collarbone, and Marcus watched the glints of gold come off it, shining in the sun. Here, Marjorie said, have it. She lifted the stone from her neck and placed it around Marcus's. Welcome home. He felt the stone hit his chest hard and hot, before finding its way up to the surface again. He touched it, surprised by its weight. Marjorie splashed him suddenly, laughing loudly before swimming away toward the shore. And that is the end of Homegoing by Yad Jesse. Ooh, I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I do, even my fourth, fifth, however many time reading it. Um, I'm really eager to hear your thoughts on this one.